Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good morning. So glad to be with you, excited to be with you, and I hope that you will be encouraged by all that God has planned for you today. One of the things that I enjoy uh, so much about um, how God works is that we get to see, we get to see um, God doing so many things in people's lives, um, and we get to see it sometimes in a way that we would never have written, right? We never would have uh, had the story turn out that way. And yet, one of the uh, really encouraging things for me is that God is bigger than my mess-ups, God is bigger than my weaknesses, God is bigger than my insecurities and my failures, the list can go on and on. God will have his way, God will get his glory, you will be changed into the image of Christ. And, uh, and for that I'm ever thankful. God will win every time. I want to do a few housekeeping things before we get into the main part of the message and I'd like to highlight uh, two things. Number one, we, we want you to know, our church family, that at this time I've been um, kind of on a different schedule where I'm not preaching as often and it doesn't have to do anything with my jaw. I still have some issues with my jaw but they're always uh, improving week in and week out and I think I could preach on a regular basis without too many uh, hindrances but one of the things that happened is in March we had a transition we had uh, John Vandalin who was our executive administrator had to go back to Duke Energy for a project out in Rio Grande City and so he had to go full-time he drives out every day he lives in a car for two hours which uh, is hard to do but he now is way out there and doing that and then of course I had my surgery at the end of March and it was a three-month recovery um, and then when I got back to work or you know cleared to work from the doctor we hit the ground running with just all of our summer initiatives we have outreaches VBS we had our picnic we had uh, different uh, things that we do and so the tyranny of the immediate was right in front of us of getting all those things done and then we caught our breath and we said oh my word uh, I remember Brandy and I having this conversation even Tara we're doing a really good job maintaining <laughs> because great plans have been put in place and there's so many things that uh, when John was executive of the of the church he laid amazing foundations for us but we're not able to proceed past just maintaining Sunday to Sunday to Sunday. And so um, we decided for me to step back from preaching since we are very short staffed currently. And I'm doing a lot more of administrative things in the church at, at this time. For those of you that have been a part of church ministry before, you know that September, October, and many times November are the heaviest administrative months for a church. We have to figure out our budget. We have to figure out our initiatives for 2020. What ministries do we let go? What ministries do we add? Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done in the back office of things. And so we are looking. Uh, we can't, I can't do administration and be looking to hire somebody. It, it's too much. But as I'm nailing down things for 2020 and all of that, one of our main goals for 2020 will be to hire an associate pastor. And so as soon as um, I'm able to, to kind of see past just the, the, the initiatives and preparation for 2020, then I'll go back to looking to hire somebody. And when we hire somebody, then I'll be able to go back to my regular uh, teaching and preaching schedule. We wanted you to know that so you can know how to pray um, for who the next man will be that joins our staff. And I just want to give a big shout out for Donna. Donna has uh, made a very smooth transition. We know that Brandy, which is here today, super pumped to have you, Brandy, um, is moving to Austin. And so that was another uh, thing, right? I mean, here's a, a glue person. And Donna has just walked into that so beautifully. Um, and I'm very, very thankful. And I want to give her a hand. We love you, Donna. Thank you so much for your work. Where's she at? There she is. Donna, you've you're been amazing to, to work with and uh, a real, real joy. Second item is I want to show you, some of you have asked about where do I go 
to find a Redeemer's audio for sermons and things like that. And we have, we have Facebook right now. We're in the middle of launching a new website. I think you're going to love that. That's another project that we're working on. And one of the things that we've moved to is a YouTube channel. And so let me kind of connect and see if I can show you off of my thing. I wanted to show you to see if, if it made sense. Okay, good. And so you can easily go just onto um, YouTube channel and in the search engine you're going to write Redeemer RGV and if you write Redeemer RGV it'll take you to this page this is our page that has all of our sermons that we've been uploading and that type of thing a real important piece to this according to Josh which I'm super pumped to see Josh sitting down today in the audience that's awesome with his lovely wife he's developed a great team and he says that it's very key for us to subscribe. We have to have about 100 subscribers on YouTube, and it takes our capabilities and what we can do with that channel to another level. We are able to define things. We're able to prioritize things. And so if you'll just do that, commit to go to YouTube and subscribe to it. Get us over 100. We're pretty close, he said and it will really facilitate our ability to promote our church and for you to have better and quicker access to any of these types of things. All right, those were the two family items. The beauty of Christian freedom is our message today. The beauty of Christian freedom. You can open up there, but we're not gonna read it. I have a long, long intro actually. Go to Galatians chapter five. And really we're looking at verses 13, 14, and 15, but I, I want to read just for context sake all the way to 18. So go there and let me jump in to this intro because I think this intro will really help you tremendously to understand what is being taught biblically about freedom. Um, the whole book of Galatians is about freedom, right? And um, it's, it's just this magnus opus on what it is to be free in Christ. But what does that mean? There's at times so, so many odd definitions or counter definitions to understanding what it means to be free. So let me get into uh, a story I wrote. But it's a real story because I've seen it happen to many of my dear friends and it's happened even to me. We have a young married couple and they're in love. And uh, it was a joy for many people to see them falling in love and committing their lives to each other. And it was awesome. You could also, I could have written this about a young college student, by the way. I thought about doing that. But we are enjoying that they are in love. And one of the joys of a young marriage, right, are these newfound freedoms. The freedom of, hey, buying our own furniture and getting our own place and even the freedom of intimate expression, right? Because God has said not to ever have intimacy outside of marriage. And so one of the joys of a young marriage is what? To be able to express love to one another without any hindrances. And this is so wonderful. It's so invigorating. It's such a joyful thing. And as they go together, they often will say, just you and me, baby, and our love. We can make it. Let's have another can of beans or whatever, right? And they're able to just really delight in even the simplest of things because this newfound freedom um, is so joyful. They're able to follow their heart's desire. Like one of the fun things I remember that I did a few times with Trinette, but you have to understand she was pregnant 30 days after we got married, so we had kids. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Preston came October 19th on the, our 10-month anniversary after our marriage. But, you know, let's go to San Antonio. Why? Because we can, right? That's what young love does, right? They have freedom, no, nothing hindering their schedule. And it's just a lot of fun. This new freedom, this new opportunity is, um, is something that, that many of us have experienced. But six months later, this young wife begins to see some cracks in life or to see some just hardships in life. And the young wife is not doing so well anymore. And she says, I have no friends. I know that we've enjoyed each other and we've been living on love for six months, but I haven't 
talk to any of my friends. Maybe she says, I feel spiritually dry. You know what? I know we're having fun and we're going to the beach twice in the month and we love to sleep in and have our pancake Sunday or whatever, but we've only gone to church six times in half a year. And it's just something's wrong. There's something in my heart right now and I just don't know what's going on. And then there's actually relational issues. He's not really listening to me. And things are not as fun, right, as they were in the beginning. And she is not alone. The guy himself at six months is also beginning to see some things in his life. And one of the things that comes to the forefront of this thing is that he had a weakness. And maybe his minor weakness in life is that he really struggled at times with being productive. He was kind of lazy. And she overlooked it. She never brought it up one time when they were engaged. I wonder why not, right? Because it never affected her personally. It affected her mom and her in-laws or it affected him. But now they're living together, doing life together, and his weakness of laziness is becoming a greater issue. But she had a minor weakness as well. She was very judgmental. He would often go, yeah, babe, you're right. Uh-huh, exactly my thoughts. And she was always very judgmental. Boom, this, that, 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 always being very critical. But this weakness of hers is now turning on him. And before what he thought was a minor thing is now becoming a major thing to the point that he says, I'll just stay at work a little longer because I get chewed out when I get home. And for justifiable reasons, the oil hasn't been changed on the car, uh, the air conditioner filter hasn't been cleaned, the grass hasn't been cut. And there's justification in her concern of him doing his part. But the fact of the matter is things are not as fun as we hoped. They're not as fun as we hoped. So what happened? There was this newfound freedom. There was this opportunity to delight and enjoy and now it's starting to kind of spiral out of control and I'm not going to give you an answer of what went wrong I hope the sermon will answer that for us because there's something inherent in this little story and I could have used a college student I could have used anybody so in moving to a new city and you're free no one is you know watching over your shoulder and you have no obligations and you can chart your own course, but with that always seems to come, if we're not managing it right, some type, right, of downgrade. And in today's passage, we're going to see four things. The nature of worldly freedom, what the world thinks is freedom, the nature of Christian freedom, what the Bible really teaches about what it is to be free, and then the purity of in Christian freedom. I got to tell you, this is going to be awesome. There is a purity to our freedom. There is something in our life about freedom that you can just absolutely just take in and have no shame about. And then the power in Christian freedom will be how we conclude our sermon today. Open your Bibles, right? I said we're going to go to Galatians. Let's read Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 13 to 18. And I'm going to pray and ask God to help us. 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite... And devour one another. Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk in the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those or for these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. That you want to do. It opposes you. So, so amazing. It keeps you from doing what you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit. You are not under the law. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and declare our dependence on you. God, you teach us that 
we will get nothing from your word without your Holy Spirit participation to illuminate, to bring to life, to reveal, to open your word, just like we sang in that last hymn, opened up your word to me. And so, God, we pray for that. We want to acknowledge that. We want, God, for you to show us from your word all that you have for us today. And Father, I pray as well that we would be open to whatever you teach us. God, whatever area of our lives that you put a flashlight on, that you illuminate, God, would we be responsive today? Lord, if it's a call for repentance, we repent. If it's a call, God, to do a step of obedience, we take that step. And so, God, we want this to be a time of renewal, of recalibration, of beginning to walk again, Lord, in the path that you have for us. And so, lastly, I feel so loved by you, God, through your word. You love us and you care about us and you do not leave us orphans and you send us the Holy Spirit to literally love on us as we go through it. And so, God, may we sense your love today. In Christ's name, amen. So the nature of worldly freedom, the nature of worldly freedom. So Christ has set us free indeed. This is why we're free. And we see people here being warned about being careful how to use their freedom. And I think it all starts because we need to have a biblical understanding of freedom. This is one of my favorite subjects. I think it's one of my favorite subjects because for years I've worked with young people and they make an absolute mess of understanding freedom. And so do you. You just know how to hide it. What is the definition for worldly freedom? Getting to do whatever we want to do without restrictions as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. Most people in the world would tell you that that is pretty much on point. And freedom resonates with us. We long for it. We want it. It's something ingrained in us. We want freedom, as the passage said uh, later on in verse 17. But too often the world's view of freedom is this. It's an absence of restrictions. It's, it's, it's being able to do and say and act any way we so desire. If we live by that definition, then a falling rock seems to, to be okay, right? You throw a rock, nothing's restricting it, stop it. I know Daniel's thinking, yes, it is gravity, but we'll talk about that later. But, you know, a, a, a rock that is falling should be the happiest thing in the world, or letting go of a helium balloon should be like the most ideal thing in the world, right? And so this definition of getting to do whatever we want to do seems a little bit lacking. See, I think the essence of somebody who's thinking about freedom, maybe that young couple or that young college student is, finally I get to make my own decisions. Finally, I kind of get to chart my own course. No one to tell me, you know, when to go to bed or when to get up or how to do things. And at the essence of this mindset is that they have a concept of freedom from. There's something that we're free from. There was something over us. There was something restricting us. And the essence of somebody who thinks like this is that they think that they are finally free because things that were impeding them have now been taken away. And that's part of it, but mainly that's the essence of freedom for them. The restrictions or boundaries that were imposed by another have finally been removed. And when you think about this type of description or understanding of freedom, it can sound pretty good. If I went to the right, if I went to a college and I got to talk to a bunch of students, I could get them going by just saying, you will do whatever you want to do. Dream whatever you want to dream. Act any way you want to act. And they'd be like, yes, yes. But we all know that it's absolutely unrealistic. Like there is just nothing in our world that tells us that real freedom is the absence of getting to do whatever we want to do, right? Like, you know, I, if I get to do whatever I do, that's the most free. There's just no such thing. And we can see it, I, I think, in two ways. I want to, first of all, just say physical uh, realty. No, not a piece of property. Uh, I'm, it's a typo. Physical reality. is like you say, I will... I want to jump off a cliff. 
Really? Absence of restrictions. Yes, no boundaries, nothing holding me back. Except reality is going to hit you in the face very soon. That is what is going to happen, whether we agree or not. I think of somebody who loves to eat. And they never, ever put any boundaries or restrictions on their diet. And they just eat whatever they want, when they want, how they want. And they will be brought to reality when the doctor gives them, right, his counsel. Do you want to live? Do you want to see your grandchildren? Do you want to be able to maintain the workload you have? Physical things are going to come and hit you in the face that maybe freedom isn't just the absence of these restrictions. But even human experience is a greater teacher than that. Our human experience tells us that there's things that we long to do that we can't do or we are in battle to do. I think of just the verse there in 17, the sinful nature desires contrary to the spirit so that you do not do what you want. And the scriptures teach us that we actually have quite a bit of conflict. And in human experience, there is no greater awakening to the loss of your freedoms than having a child. The day that happens, you don't get to chart your course, right mom, for how you sleep. Gone. You don't get to do that. Because something has been imposed upon you and you actually realize that even in our human experiences, someone who lived like this would be honestly unbearable. You just will do whatever you want, how you want, when you want, without any feelings for me or other people. Well, this person doesn't get a job. This person doesn't get promoted. This person doesn't do well in life. Because this definition that many people in our world absolutely believe is the ultimate expression of freedom are wrong. And we know that. And the scripture teaches something quite contrary. I want to just give a quick application here. This loss of freedom, this supposed loss of freedom is a major objection to Christianity. You might be somebody here today that you've been thinking about Jesus and you're kind of warming up to it. But one of the things that you resist so much that really puts a lot of fear in you is like, ah, oh, if I accept Jesus, there goes my freedom. If I become a Christian, there goes my ability to do whatever I want to do. And for that objection alone, you resist trusting in Christ. And I can identify, I understand your concern. But the biblical truth <clears throat> is that Christ came for freedom. Jesus' is actually first sermon in Isaiah 61, 1, he reads this passage very early on in his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and release to the oppressed. Jesus later on will be very clear that he is here for freedom's sake. And he says in John 8, 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Or Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We've been learning about that. And so the person who is really struggling right now, and you want to come towards God, but you think it means that now you're not going to get to enjoy life, I encourage you to understand that Christ is all about your freedom. Let's take a look at the nature, the nature of Christian freedom. So if that's the nature of worldly freedom... They think and d define it as an absence of restrictions, being able to do what you, your heart desires. A definition for Christian freedom is necessary. I think the way that Christian freedom work is doing what you, what, what you were perfectly designed to do. Christian freedom, the best way to understand it is that you do what you were perfectly designed to do. That is a really good understanding of Christian freedom. And he, I, I'm going to have to new and, uh, kind of explain it through different sentences. Real freedom is knowing which of the things we most want to do is siding with what we were designed for. Christian freedom is me knowing what to do according to how I was designed to be. Real freedom is doing what you want. What you really, really want. What you really at the deepest level long for. 
That's Christian freedom. It's, it's a desire to do something that's right and good and it lines up with how God has designed everything. And so one of the ways that I have really bec- uh, been able to learn or grow or understand this is this concept, and I know I've shared it in church before, liberating restrictions. God has designed life with liberating restrictions. He has made it so that when we have this newfound freedom in Christ, the one that he celebrates in verse 13, for you were called to freedom, yes! But then he warns, what? But brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And so there's got to be some type of boundaries. If I'm going to be truly experiencing the freedom that I have in Christ, it comes with some type of guidelines or parameters or, or you know, railways to get me to understand how to do it. And I call these things liberating restrictions. Well, I don't. A lot of dead people do and a lot of good Christians do as well. See, real freedom is, is found in the right restrictions. In the right so Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot has used these illustrations a lot in her life. Um, Tim Keller more currently. Think of a fish. You know, the fish who's sitting in his aquarium and he's looking over and this guy's on the couch and he's, you know, eating Cheetos and popcorn and watching TV and he's like, that's the life. Get me on that couch. So someday he gets his wish. The cat knocks him out or something. And very soon his life is an in utter terror and a disaster because he wasn't made right to really be free outside of water he was designed for water he's the most free when he's living underneath of that restriction it's a liberating restriction think about how a plane is designed you know a a plane you should if you don't think about this well maybe you shouldn't maybe you're full of anxiety when you fly but you should be thinking as you're sitting on the tarmac going, okay, what's the weight of this thing? Okay. How many tons are we talking about? Look around. Do people look healthy or unhealthy? I don't know what you do. But you should be calculating things because this thing is big. And you should be wondering, how in the world is this plane going to take off? How is that going to happen? Because a designer made it so, and he understood the laws that apply to aerodynamics, and he was able to say, if I have this much force, and if I have this, these kind of angles, and if I have this type of scenario, I can get this thing off, and we can get it in the air. It's really an amazing thing, right? But when is a, pra- a plane most free? Well, let's go throw it in the ocean. It'll sink real quick, right? Because it's designed to be in the air and you see it's full potential and it's full of uh, beauty and it's and it's full uh, usage because it's living according to its designs and so I think this is important as you think about what are the liberating restrictions that God has put into our lives design dictates the fullest and most enjoyable experience even if it's true for a fish and if it's true for a plane it's true for you and for me That God is about us experiencing, enjoying freedom to the fullest according to his design. And if the essence, to me, of freedom for the world is that I am, right, free from things, which is also the truth in Christianity. We're free from our sin nature and we're free from, but what Christianity really focuses on is that now you're free for you're free to you're free to enjoy and participate and do these things that's the real essence of Christian freedom is you were limited before you were restricted before but now because Christ has come and that because you have now uh, set your hope in him look what you are free for and I think you are made free for something. And I think two things specifically. The first one is relationally. You are free to relate to God. This is what has taken place. You have been free to finally correspond and relate to God. And you could never do that before because of your sin or because of 
because of impediments, but you now are free to pursue God, to love God, to have God, to enjoy God. You're free to finally be able to commune with him. But that's not where the verse goes, does it? Our scripture, if you go back to verse 14, well, I'm sorry, verse 13 at B, it says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, and he counters that, and he says, but through love serve one another. He challenges us, and he says, your freedom has been given to you, so practically you are able to serve. You're able to sacrifice. You're able to worship. You're empowered to forgive. You have been free to do these things, and you weren't able to do those before. Through love, serve one another. Let's think about marriage for a little bit. In marriage, if I'm going to enjoy marriage to the fullest, right? If I'm going to experience everything that marriage is supposed to have, well, one of them is, comes with the restrictedness of a loss of freedom. You know, you never get to go out whenever you want to go out again. If you do, you'll learn real quick, right? Right? Where are you going? When are you coming back? Like somebody's, somebody's checking on somebody. But for a marriage to be successful, both must give and sacrifice and limit themselves for good of the other. This is fundamental. Any marriage that does not have these liberating restrictions in it will not be successful. It's impossible. It's absolute failure when someone is demanding or using or thinking only of self, the day that you walk in and go, this marriage is about an absence of restrictions for me, that marriage will fail. The other person will feel used. The other person will be like, it's all about you and your gratification. It's all about you and your agenda. Why are you not limiting yourself for the good of our marriage? And this is exactly what God has in mind. When he makes you free, he makes you free for something. Specifically for us to love our neighbor as ourself. Which we could never do before. But now we can. And so I want to apply it. It begins to help me make sense of the law. Because I think a lot of us have probably been struggling a little bit as we go through Galatians. And is the law good? Is the law bad? It's what's going on? Do we just throw away the law? Do we, how do we interact with it? And I've always been very sensitive to this. Because I always say everything that God makes is good. And so we need to understand its benefits for us. But when I think about what the Galatian people here were struggling with, it was not so much that they were called to keep the law. The issue is not that we keep a law, but why? Why do you keep a law? What's your motivation by, you know, putting a restriction on your life? What are you hoping to gain? And we've discovered, and I don't have to repeat it again because so many of you have done a good job as we've been going through it, but are you relying or are you obeying? What are you doing with the law of God in your life? Are you relying on it? Is it the way that you make a deal with God? Is it the way you make, get favor with God? What, what is truly going on when you decide to put a restriction in your life? A liberating restriction, by the way. And I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up more of the law in just a little bit. But one of the things that really stood out to me, just a side note, my first sermon ever that I preached was this passage so my first sermon I think I was like 18 years old or something like that but um, one of the things that you notice if you'll see if you'll go down with me to verse uh, 14 for the whole law is fulfilled in one word you shall love your neighbor as yourself but then he does this crazy transition but if you bite and devour one another watch out that you are not consumed by one another wait a second You just told me the whole law is fulfilled by one word, that I love my neighbor as myself. That's right. And if you're not doing that, you're going to just bite and devour one another. I mean, it's it's very drastic, right? And because at times, 
He's talking to these Galatian believers. He's talking to Christians. He's warning them, if you misuse the law, and instead of allowing the law to help you understand how to relate to God, how to relate to people, we're going to get there in a little bit, and you're not using all your biblical knowledge to know how to love people well, then what you will actually do is consume people and use people even with the law and for a long time the words seemed overly dramatic to me bite devour consume it's like i mean would people really do that to one another and there's actually a hidden biblical truth here that we either are living out of satisfaction or starvation you are living either out of fullness or a sense of longing for more and this is what the passage is showing us enjoy the freedom you have in Christ but don't use it for yourself because you are so fully loved and so fully enjoyed and so able and capable to understand the love of God now go love your neighbor as yourself so what does somebody do that doesn't have that type of sense of God's love in their life? They consume other people. And I think the language here of starvation, this animalistic terminology, is very, very, very important. Because if you always have a sense of lacking, you have a sense of not measuring up, if you always have a, this continual insecurity with God, then you're not going to be able to ever love people. You're only going to be able to use people. And I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it looks like a Bible study. I don't care if it looks like prayer requests. If at the very core of your life is that you are not satisfied with all that God has for you, you cannot love people. If you are a religious uh, enslaved person, I don't measure up. God's only going to be happy if I do this. God will never accept me. God will never enjoy me. I don't care how good it looks. You're just using people. And that is a scary thing, folks. And I think someone who's in starvation mode has a sense of lacking, insecure, insufficient, and you always need more. I got to do to measure up. I got I to perform more. And then I'll be okay. Somebody who is biting and devouring and consuming other people, they're doing it because they're starving. And God has a, a totally different expectation for us. He wants to bring us satisfaction. He wants us to put our deadly doings down, lay them down at Jesus' feet. Find in him your all in all. And rest in him complete. It's only this person who feels accepted, who is in the beloved, that will, ab will be able to ever love his neighbor properly. Because then he is marked by otherness and fullness and abundance. You have to give. There's something in you. You're able to give away. Because you have deep satisfaction in your heart. And I think this is such an important key. And you say, how does this, what does this have to do with my freedom? See, because some of the things that we learned is that if you don't really understand what Christ has freed you from, this enslaving principle of sin, this enslaving principle of never measuring up, this enslaving principle of you having to go merit God's favor. And it can be done religiously or irreligiously. It doesn't matter. The principle is the same. And this is my only concern that we, as we go through Galatians is that a lot of you are only viewing these people's struggle as a religious struggle. I don't care if you're religious they're doing the same thing. They just go about it a different way. I'm going to be a somebody. I'm going to make money. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be respected. That's their religion. That's their path to gaining significance. And so on their journey to be wealthy, be successful, they will bite and devour people, even the people they say they love. 
It's no different. And we'll never be able to love our neighbor freely, joyfully, thankfully, without a sense of satisfaction and fullness in our heart. I hope that makes sense. Because that leads me to our third point, is the purity in our freedom. See, the moral law of God is very, very good. I've been reading a lot about this, and without God's law, and we've done some of this as a church, like, it helps us to know ourselves. It's a schoolmaster. I see that every time I try to keep the law, I send even further. Oh, my word, I am far more wicked than I thought. I'm, I'm in far need of greater rescue than I could ever have imagined. So the law in its good work does that for me. It helps us know how to love God. I want to know to love God. How do I love God? Well, the scriptures and the law can tell you how to do that. It gives you understanding of that. Whoever loves me will keep my commandments. Helps us to know how to love others. How do I love my neighbor? How do I love these people? How do I do what's best for them? I mean, how do you know what is the best thing for a person, y'all? Are you going to make that up? You know what's best in your dating relationship? You know what's best on how to raise your children? You think you have that figured out? You're going to need God's instruction to be able to do that. So even to love your neighbor as yourself will need to come with great biblical understanding. What is best for my neighbor in this situation is for me to speak the truth in love. And so it, the law is helping us with that. And it helps us live a flourishing life. The law is there. What God has given us, his moral code, all of these things... They're, they're there for our flourishing. They're liberating restrictions in our life. But you say, why are you going about to this purity in our freedom? Because what is hinted at in this section is an even greater law. It's called the law of Christ. And I think I've been meditating about this more than anything else as we go through Galatians. Because later on, you're going to see in Galatians ch chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is he talking about? Tom mentioned it last week. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Wait a second. I, don't I need to keep this and the Sabbath and keep this? If you love another person... You fulfill the law. Okay, what's going on with that? James 1.12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. It's the same thing. There's this liberating principle that's better and even greater than just the moral law that's been revealed in God's word. Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. And I'm not even able to... Sorry, folks, I'm not able to really unpack that this week. How in the world is it that if I'm led by the Spirit, then I am not under the law? Because it is not about a mere list of rules and restrictions and things like that. They're helpful, they're liberating things. I, I, I don't want to lie, but a greater thing that happens in you and me as Christians is that one day we are going to be able... And I'll tell you who this lady is in a little bit. That we will be able to depend on the Holy Spirit and we will be motivated by the love of Christ that you will do things that you've never been commanded to do in the law ever. You will do things that are not even in this book towards other people. Because life's too complex. There's no way that God could have put every single command, jot and diddle like it's too complex. The cultures change. Things happen. And so there's something even greater than his moral law. And that is the law of Christ. Her name is Evangeline Booth. She is the daughter of William Booth, who started the Salvation Army. And I know this is going to take a long time, but I think you're going to absolutely enjoy this story. Because it reiterates the point that I'm trying to make today. 
that you want to be truly free? You want to experience Christian freedom? It's not about you just going, okay, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to treat this person? (laughs) How do I want to treat them? How do I want to do good for them? Let me give you an example. Some of you have read this and you're aware, but this is Evangeline Booth, who was the daughter of William Booth. She writes in her diary, as one who ministered often, I'm sorry, in the autobiography they write, as one who ministered often to the dregs of society, she found herself one morning outside the large iron gates of a local police court in temporary prison. Waiting for the gates to open, she heard the shuffling of heavy feet and loud, agitated voices. In her own words, and I'm quoting from her, she says, the gates opened wide and I witnessed a sight which if eternity could wash away from my mind, time never can. It was a woman. Two policemen walked in front and two behind. Two policemen walked in front and two behind. One stalwart man firmly held the right and the other the left. You had six men escorting one woman. Her hair was uncombed and it was matted and disheveled. Her right temple was blackened and bruised. Clots of dry blood stood upon her left temple. Her clothes were torn and bloodstained. She tried to wrench her arms from the grasp of the policeman. The very atmosphere of the morning was laden with curses and oaths. She tossed her head wildly as the six policemen dragged her down the passageway. What could I do? She thought. One more moment. And the uh, golden opportunity to be of help would be gone. She'd be put into the back. Could I offer a prayer? Not enough time. Could I sing? It would be absurd. Just so you know, a lot of this era would sing to people. They would sing to homeless people. They would sing to people that they'd bring to the soup kitchen. They would just sing hymns over them. So it was a common strategy of showing the love of God. Could I give her money? She could not take it. Could I quote a verse or scripture? She would not heed it. She writes now in her personal words, whether it was divine suggestion or not, I did not stop to think. But the impulse of a burning desire which filled my heart as she passed made me step forward and kiss her on the cheek. Whether the police were taken off their guard by my extraordinary action, They relaxed their grasp, I do not know, but with one wrench, she freed her arms and she clasped her hands as the wind spread her matted, disheveled hair and she looked toward the gray skies and said, my God, she looked about wildly for a moment and then said, my God, who kissed me? My God, who kissed me? No one has kissed me since my mother died. And lifting her tattered apron, she burled her face in her hands and like a little lamb she was led to the vehicle which took her to prison later I went to the prison in the hope of seeing her and as the door stood the ward and and at the door stood the warden when I approached the warden she said we think her mind is gone she does nothing but pace up and down her cell asking me every time I go in if I know who kissed her would you let me go in and speak with her I asked I'm her only best friend. The door was open and I slipped in. Her face was clean. Her eyes were large and they were beautiful. And she says, do you know who kissed me? And then she sat down and told me her story. When I was a little girl of seven years old, my widowed mother died. She died very, very poor. She died in a back basement in the dark, and when she was dying, she called me to her, and she took my little face in her hands, and she kissed me and said, oh, my poor little girl, my defenseless little girl. Oh, God, have pity on my little girl. And God, when I am gone, would you protect her and take care of her? From that day to this day, no one has ever laid a kiss upon me. Until recently, do you know who kissed me? Do you know who it is that kissed me? I then told her that it was I. 
that there was somebody who was prompting me to do it. There was a life of someone who was so much more tender than I and that he was sent to the cross and he bore our sins upon himself and that he was wounded for our transgressions, that he might put the kiss of pardon on all of our brows. In him, this lady found light and joy and comfort and salvation and healing and love. Before she was released from prison, the warden testified not only to change in her life, but to its beauty. She was made through Christ the means of salvation to a number of others who were down as low as she had been and who were bound with fetters as heavy as those with which she herself had once been bound. Why the story? Because you're not going to find that in a mere moral law. You're not going to know what words to say to someone that you've terribly hurt. You don't even know how to express it. But with the Spirit's help and with the motivation of God's love in your heart, it will be your faith working itself out through love that will trump anything a moral law could do. The law of Christ. The law of Christ. It's a much higher standard, folks. God's law is good and perfect and wonderful, but the law of Christ is greater. And when you find full freedom in being able to express that love and sacrifice for others, and you don't do it begrudgingly, but joyfully and thankfully, then the law of Christ is active in your life and heart. That's how all of the law can be encompassed in one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. I want to finish this. Um, How do we uh, tap into this? The word became flesh. God became human. The invisible became invisible. The untouchable became touchable. Eternal life experienced temporal death. The unlimited became limited. The infinite became finite. The immutable became mutable. The unbreakable became fragile. The independent became dependent. The almighty became weak. The love became the hated. The exalted was humbled. Just as if I want to have a successful marriage with my wife, I will have to limit myself. I will have to gladly restrict myself for our greater good together. And Jesus has done that for you. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself to death, to death on a cross. Our freedom will be motivated by that love. And you will be able to love your neighbor and to do things that have have yet to ever be written because the Spirit will propel you and the power of the love of Christ will control you to do these things. That's why it says that if you walk in the Spirit, you don't need the law. You will go above it. It will be even greater. It will be the law of Christ in your heart. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, be with people today. Be with people today that are struggling right now. Maybe they've been wanting to do their own thing. Maybe, God, they've been wanting to hold on to things. They want to do life their way. And, God, they need to realize that you have moved towards them in love. God, that you took on flesh, that you experienced loneliness and pain and rejection and suffering so that you, God, could bring them into the family of God. And so, God, would you open people's lives and hearts right now to just accept your son, 
Lord, bring people into your family today. And the next group I want to pray for, God, is that there's people right now, God, who are struggling. And you, through your spirit, are bringing a liberating restriction into their life. I don't know what that is. It could be one that's already written in the word. They're struggling with lying. They're struggling with laziness. And God, they need to add some of these things to their life, to experience the fullness of life. But God, it could be something not even written in your word. They're needing to to remove something from their life that's a good thing that has become an ultimate thing and it's hurting them. And so God, maybe they, they need to step back in some areas in life. Maybe God, you're convicting them that you know, they, they work too much. They don't have any time, God, for their family. They don't have any time, God, to serve you. They don't do anything, God, to serve you in this church or other people. And so, God, they need to bring that liberating restriction into their life to experience the fullness of everything you have for them. And so, God, whether they need to be open to Jesus' love for them on the cross, or God, whether we need to respond in trusting you with whatever you're telling us, God, to do in our own life and heart, would we be open to it? Because we trust you, God. We love you, God. How can we not? You've given us your son. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we 